In this final video for aromatic chemistry, we're going to talk about a class of reactions known as cross-coupling reactions. And what these entail is basically the idea that you're going to take one component that has a, a halogen substituent, basically, so it looks like an electrophile, and react that with another uh, substrate that is, has a metal on it, so it looks like a nucleophile. Now, uh, as we've seen in the case of aromatics, these two would not normally uh, react you know, in the usual way of typical substitution reactions. But what can happen in these cases is if we throw in a transition metal catalyst, and usually this is going to be a palladium catalyst, we can actually connect these two uh, via a carbon-carbon bond. And so we have cross-coupled two species using this transition metal. Okay. Now, it turns out that this class of reactions, cross-coupling reactions, have become one of the most useful synthetic tools uh, in the entire world. Um, and this has uh, ramifications far beyond just chemistry. Um, they're enormously useful for many reasons. And one of the biggest reasons is in the pharmaceutical industry. Cross-coupling chemistry is used on a daily basis all around the world uh, to make uh, drug compounds and to uh, for the process of discovering uh, new drug candidates. So it's enormously useful. Um, it, it really has transformed the way that chemists think about putting together molecules um, in very dramatic ways. So it's hard to overstate the importance of this class of reactions. And uh, because of that, um, the, uh, sort of the, the cross-coupling field was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2010. And specifically, that award went to Richard Heck, Aichi Nagishi, and Akira Suzuki. And uh, all three of these actually have um, very prominent organic reactions named after them, um, all of which are, are palladium catalyzed in nature. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about cross-coupling reactions. Um, and first, I'm going to start with the nature of the, the halogen component. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about the cross-coupling of aryl compounds. There's actually a number of different things that one can use for cross-coupling. Um, but for our purposes, uh, these can be anything, any of the halogens. So aryl chlorides, aryl bromides, aryl iodides. Um, there's another class, though, that's actually really important as well, and that is aryl sulfonate esters. So if you imagine, a sulfonate ester um, can be derived very simply from a phenol. So if you react a phenol with something like a sulfonyl chloride with a little bit of base, you can actually make a sulfonate ester of that phenol. And it turns out that because of the electron withdrawing nature of the sulfonate, uh, this actually acts as if it was a halogen, which basically means that it's a good enough leaving group that it can react with a palladium catalyst. So this is actually an important class. Even though it's not a halogen, it allows you to take uh, phenols which are very widely spread um, and use them to to make carbon carbon bonds via this cross coupling technology Okay, so we've got the halogens and we got sulfonate esters um, And the two specific cases that we'll be concerned with are uh, the tosylates, right? So the toluene sulfonates, which is uh, usually called tosylate um, and that just has a, a sulfonate with a, a, a toluene substituent on it and then the uh, more reactive um, ones are, are the trifluoromethane sulfonates, which are uh, usually called triflates. So this is the triflate group. And this is actually uh, reasonably reactive, uh, very much like the halogens. And these can react as well. Okay, so those are the two sulfonates. All right, what about the, the metal component? What can that be? Well, as it turns out, it can be an uh, absolutely enormous range of different organometal species. Um, in fact, uh, it's much uh, less common for something to not react as an organometal than for it uh, uh, to react. But um, the, we're just going to focus on two categories just to make things relatively simple. Um, but recognize that there's a whole other world out there that covers most of the periodic table. But for our purposes, we're going to focus on two. And so usually it's the nature of the organometal that gives these reactions their specific names. So the one component um, that, is, that is viable are organomagnesium reagents, which you probably know as Grignard reagents. So these uh, can be cross-coupled, and, and when we use an organomagnesium, it's called a Kumata coupling. The other one, which is actually probably the most important in terms of uh, pharmaceutical development, are the boronic acids. Okay, so boronic acid or anything that's a, a derivative of that. So, for example, a boronate ester will also be viable. These are called Suzuki couplings, and they are um, probably the most uh, used cross-coupling reaction in pharmaceutical development. Now, you're probably wondering, 
uh, how is it that I'm counting boron as a metal? Um, and we'll talk about the mechanism by which that um, actually gets engaged in this process. You're right, boron is not a metal, um, but in, uh, in the Suzuki coupling, it actually acts as if it was a metal, and so it, it's actually quite desirable. Okay, so as I said, a lot of other metal species can participate, and some of the more common ones involve tin, zinc, or, or silicon. Um, if you're inter interested, you can follow up on that, but we'll just focus on the Kumada and the Suzuki. Okay, so here I just show one example. I could pick um, any of a thousand different examples. I just thought I'd show this one. So this is actually a, um, a paper that was published by Danishevsky, who is an emeritus professor here at Columbia. Um, and I just show this, you're not supposed to appreciate um, or, or to absorb the complexity of this, but um, I show it just to impress upon you the complexity of molecules that can be engaged um, in something like a Suzuki coupling, which this is. So you can see here that what Danishevsky does is to take this tyrosine derivative, which has a boronate ester, and then this other uh, reasonably complex piece, which has an aryl iodide, and using palladium catalysis, he's able to forge that carbon-carbon bond between those two aryl groups on way to making this uh, rather complex natural product molecule. Right, so that's the power of the Suzuki coupling, that it can allow you to basically just click together different pieces under uh, reasonably mild conditions. Okay, so how does this work? All right, so in order to understand the mechanism of a cross-coupling reaction, we first have to talk about a couple of um, mechanistic steps that uh, occur with transition metal chemistry. Okay, so the first one we need to understand is something called oxidative addition. So it turns out that a transition metal that has a pair of electrons to donate can engage in this process of oxidative addition, whereby the metal will actually insert itself between the carbon and the halogen bond. Okay, so the, the metal will actually just insert. And if you want to draw arrows here, um, which might not be fully accurate, but we can draw them anyway, um, you might imagine that the, uh, the metal uh, has this lone pair that can uh, basically donate to the halogen at the same time that the electrons from the carbon halogen bond are donating back to the metal. Okay, so w if that happens, if the metal inserts into that carbon halogen bond, you get to this type of situation. Okay, um, and by the way, L just stands for some ligand that we're not going to define. So if we get to this situation, uh, just based on the rules of formal electron counting, the metal will have been oxidized by two electrons. Right, so each of these bonds is sort of counted in terms of the metal as being uh, on the substituent, right? So that actually means that the metal is formally in a, in a plus two um, oxidation state relative to where it started. And that's why it's called an oxidative addition. The metal is adding to that bond and it formally gets oxidized by two electrons, okay? So why is this possible? Why can trans tra transition metals do that um, when we don't see normal organic molecules do this type of thing usually? Um, and the reason is because transition metals have d orbitals that they can use. So if we think about um, a sort of a, a stylized transition metal, um, a transition metal might have a d orbital that might look like this, and, and if it has a couple of electrons in it, um, a filled d orbital, um, that pair of electrons can potentially donate. At the same time, there might be an orbital here that's empty, which can accept electrons. So based on the orbital pattern of the transition metal, it can both donate and receive electrons um, sort of in the same direction. And now if we imagine this transition metal approaching our carbon X bond, uh, which might look something like this, right? So uh, we've got a carbon attached to the halogen. Now those are gonna be sigma bonded together, and the sigma bond here, that filled molecular orbital, is shown in the, in the bright pink here, right? So that's got the pair of electrons that bond the CNX together. Then there's going to be the sigma star for that sigma bond, right? The antibonding component of that molecular orbital, which is showing green and blue, okay? And so that's gonna be outside of the CX bond. Okay, so imagine these two things approaching, and what can happen is that the sigma electrons from the CX can donate into that empty metal orbital. Okay, so the donation happens that way. At the same time, the filled metal D orbital can donate back into the sigma star of the CX bond. Okay, so if you think about it, you're basically taking that bond 
and, and breaking apart the two pieces um, so that they both become bonded to the metal at the end of the day. So this pair of electrons goes to form one of the bonds and then the, the pair of electrons in the d orbital go to form the other bond. And so that's how you can have an oxidative addition um, with a transition metal, okay? All right, the next step that we wanna understand is basically the reverse of that process, so reductive elimination. It's exactly the opposite. So oxidative, eliminate, uh, oxidative addition and reductive elimination are just the forward and backward reaction. They're the same thing. But in this case, we're gonna be concerned with reductive elimination happening with two different carbon substituents, right? So we're gonna to get to a metal that has two different carbon species attached to the metal, and that can basically do the opposite of an oxidative addition. It can eliminate out to reform the metal with that lone pair and then forge a bond between those two species. So in this case now, the metal will be reduced uh, formally by two electrons compared to where it started in this intermediate. So reductive elimination, okay? Two sides of the same coin. And the final step, right, is uh, called transmetallation, okay? So this is a, um, just a, simply a process whereby we have one metal species attached to some ligand, and that could be a halogen typically, and then we're gonna have another organometal species, something different, right? And all that's gonna happen is the two are gonna switch substituents. They're just gonna swap. So this R group here will become attached to the purple metal and the X group here will become attached to the green metal, okay? So they're just doing a little bit of a dance, right? And from the point of view of this R group, it has changed the metal that it's attached to. It's gone from green metal to purple metal in this picture, okay? Now in this process, there's no oxidation change of the metal. It's, a, it's basically a neutral process. All right, so those are the three steps we need to know. Oxidative addition, transmetallation, reductive elim elimination. And we're then in a position to understand how a cross-coupling reaction occurs. And it turns out to be a very beautiful catalytic process. So here is the Kumada coupling mechanism. Okay, so what we're gonna do is start off with palladium zero. This is palladium in its, in its zero oxidation state. And what I show here is some number of ligands, so Ln, where N could be some number. Now, that, that number is uh, known, or, or it's, it, it can at least be um, uh, shown through mechanistic studies what it, what it likely is. Um, so we're sort of glossing over that, and I think any, any uh, dyed-in-the-wool chemist, true chemist, will uh, be a little bit offended by the fact that we're not discussing the ligands because the ligands are very important. But for our purposes, just to make things simple, we're just going to say that there are some ligands attached to palladium, just, just to simplify things. Okay, so we have palladium zero as our starting catalyst, okay? And what's gonna happen there is we're going to do our oxidative addition into our aryl bromide, okay? So oxidative addition, and now we've got, in this case, the phenyl and the, and the bromide attached to palladium. And you see how palladium has gone from zero up to palladium two. That's the oxidative part of that addition reaction, okay? So it's inserted into that bond. The next thing that happens is that we're going to transmetallate. So we're gonna do a transmetallation in this case with our Grignard reagent. So transmetallate, this phenyl is going to become attached to the palladium and the bromide becomes attached to the magnesium. So we get magnesium bromide as a byproduct and now we've got this diphenyl palladium too. The final step that needs to happen then is the reductive elimination where we forge that carbon-carbon bond. That's our cross-coupling product. And because this is reductive, we go from palladium two back to palladium zero, and we're ready to start the cycle again. So it's a wonderful uh, catalytic process, um, and it works quite efficiently. Okay, what about the Suzuki uh, uh, cross-coupling? Well, it's very similar to this. There's just um, one minor detail that we need to talk about. So it starts the same. We do the oxidative addition with the palladium zero to get the palladium two. Now we need to transmetallate with the boronic acid. And this is what you might think it should look like, okay, to get to that intermediate. But the problem is, is that this actually isn't ready to cross couple. Uh, this doesn't act like uh, a metal that's ready to give up its organic part um, in the way that's shown. What we need to do is just something that's a slight variant, right? This is not reactive. We need to make it reactive. And the way that we do that is by adding some base. Sodium hydroxide or other alkoxide would work here. 
what we're going to do is react the boronic acid with that hydroxide to make it into a boronate anion. Okay, so we use that empty p orbital of boron, we add hydroxide, and we get to this boronate anion. At this point, this is anionic, and so it acts very much now like a, a organometal species, which is willing to give up that organic piece to the palladium, and then uh, you, can, you can basically spit off uh, boronic acid, and then that halogen is, is, is going to be lost as sodium bromide. Now, again, for chemistry majors in the audience, um, I have glossed over way too many details um, for you to feel comfortable. So you, you might actually want to go um, and look into the details of this more if you find yourself uh, wanting to go forward uh, in, in uh, your career as a chemist. But for the purposes of this class, I think that this picture um, is reasonable enough. So with the Suzuki, we get to the same type of intermediate that we did with the Kumada. Reductive elimination gives us our product and returns the palladium zero. Okay, so that's the Suzuki. Very useful, very powerful. The only thing that we're missing here is exactly, um, right, so let me just underscore, Suzuki requires base. That's the, that's the key part of the Suzuki, that you have to have that sodium hydroxide or, or other um, uh, base involved in, so that you can uh, turn the boronic acid into the boronate. So the only piece that we're missing here is how in the world do we make boronic acids? Okay, so again, there are uh, dozens of ways to do this. Um, we're just going to pick one of the most straightforward ways and leave it at that. Um, and so this is the one that you can use in your synthetic toolbox. Basically what you can do is to take an aryl halide and convert it into a Grignard reagent. An aryl lithium would work as well, by the way. But you make it into a nucleophilic uh, metal species, and then you can react it with um, something like uh, boron, uh, tri trimethoxy boron. Okay, that'll suffice. Um, and so that makes a boronate ester, and then we're just going to hydrolyze with aqueous acid, and that gets us to our boronic acid. Okay, so in terms of writing that down, um, you can basically use th this two-step sequence. So magnesium to make the Grignard, then trap as the boronate ester, and hydrolyze. And that'll get you from an aryl halide to a boronic acid. And so now you can see that if you wanted to, for example, couple two benzenes, you could take bromobenzene, convert half of it, into um, either the aryl Grignard or the aryl boronic acid, and then couple it with the other half as the aryl bromide, so either via the Kumada or the Suzuki coupling. And that should really expand the range of uh, materials that you're able to make with this very useful type of carbon-carbon bond forming reaction.